let's say your neighbor now falls asleep. Sitting next to you, start dozing, you hear a noise, maybe embarrassing noise. How difficult would it be for you to recognize that they've fallen asleep? Would be very easy, right? Would be embarrassing, as I said, it would be trivial, maybe you start nudging them. We know how to recognize sleep when we see it. We learn to do this from when we are kids, basically. And one peculiarity is that we recognize sleep not only when it happens in individuals of our own species, but also in animals. If you walk to your room and you see your dog, cat, whatever pet you have, hamster, asleep, you recognize that they are asleep. Now, what if I ask you about this plant? What is he doing? <laughs> Difficult to say, right? It's basically impossible to say, and the reason why it's impossible to say is because we don't know what sleep is. If you knew what sleep was, perhaps we would have a way to look into the plant at the cell level, maybe even at the behavioral level, and say, yes, it is asleep. And now, to ask whether a plant can sleep or not might sound like a silly question, and in fact, it's not. It might sound like a silly question even to some colleagues of mine, but it's not. It's actually one of the most fundamental questions you can ask about sleep. Is it sleep just for us? Is it sleep, is sleep just for um, animals? able to move and think and learn, or is a, a general feature of any living thing? And as I say, we don't know this, and we are very, very far to, from answering this question. What we know, though, is that sleep is extremely conserved in the animal kingdom. As I say, you recognize sleep in hamster, you recognize sleep in <coughs> mice, rats, horses, elephants, any animal, really. You even recognize sleep in fruit flies, even though they don't have eyelids. So you cannot see whether the eyes are closed or not. And so we work based on this assumption to study sleep. That's what my lab does at Imperial College. We try to understand what sleep is for, and we mainly use fruit flies as an animal model. <clears throat> now, this is a bit of a caveat, and my talk is going to be about caveat and how we use them in science. Um, I like to think that it's something that is uh, interesting for you guys, but it might actually be uh, um, interesting also for colleagues, because it's a reminder of some caveats that sometimes we, we give for granted, and then we forgot about them, and they become a bit of a dogma. And so one of these dogma, the first one I want to talk about, is the fact that sleep is actually for the brain. As I said, we don't have any evidence for this. To actually set up an experiment and see whether sleep is only for the brain, would require us to be able to have an animal, or a human, or a person, where the brain is asleep, but the body is not. Or the other way around. The body is asleep, but the brain is awake. And we cannot do that, because we don't know what sleep is. So until we, we will be able to do that kind of experiment, the fact that sleep is only for the brain remains a very major assumption. And it's an assumption that, as I said, is a dogma. We even have our own mantra. You read on the scientific literature that sleep is of the brain, by the brain, for the brain. And most of the time, we neuroscientists really don't push this dogma very far. We are happy with it. And it's not because we are sloppy, but because at one point, science has to compromise. You have to compromise and do what you can, otherwise you'll never move forward. And so we've been compromising with this, in my opinion, for a bit too long. Now science has changed, and we are almost ready to treat sleep not as a problem of neuroscience, not as something that is for the brain, but as a problem of cell biology. And the main reason why I like to do this is because we have to recognize our failure otherwise in tackling sleep as a problem of neuroscience. So <clears throat> we've been working on sleep with modern science, let's say, for the past 100, 150 years. Of course, this is a question that is much older than that. It goes back to, uh, in fact, some of the oldest um, piece of writings that you'll ever find. But from the scientific point of view, I think we go, we go back 100, 150 years. And we've been tackling, as I said, this problem very much 
from the brain point of view, and especially ever since we discovered that brains emit electrical waves that we can record. You might have heard of this as EEG. And, and the puzzling discovery is that these waves are actually different whether you're looking at a sleeping brain or a brain that is awake. And so most of the research on sleep concentrates on this aspect, on how these waves might be related to the function of sleep and why are they different and why during certain phases of sleep, for instance, when you are very much deep asleep, the waves are very, very different from other phases of sleep, for instance, when you are in REM phase. <clears throat> or why some of these waves are identical between your state of wakefulness and some other stages of sleep. So there are plenty of puzzles if you wanted to start working on this. It will keep you busy for probably, and that's my point, another 100, 150 years. So we need to realize that maybe we're barking at the wrong tree and try some other strategy. And that's what we're trying to do in my lab, and it's not just my lab. There's uh, many other laboratories that start to think about this. And, and that's why fruit fly has became a uh, really powerful, promising model for solving this issue of this in principle. <clears throat> so, first thing, as I said, we want to look at sleep as a cell biology problem. It's something that doesn't affect only your brain, it affects all of your cells. And in a way, we know this is the case because we know that when you are sleep deprived, yes, your brain, your performance, your ability to learn and memorize, your ability to sustain exams really declines. But overall, it's your body that suffers from lack of sleep. And sleep deprivation has plenty of um, effects on your metabolism, on your skin. So there might be some underlying fundamental issue that links sl linking sleep, sleep to, to single cell, to single cell biology. So it's probably time to start looking for it. <clears throat> Before going there, however, I think another aspect that we have to um, solve is a second dogma, which says that sleep is fundamental and vital. And this is something that, again, is very much um, sustained by evidence. It's not something we made up. Um, it very much depends on the fact that sleep is universally conserved across evolution. As I said, you, see, you, you will see signs of sleep in fruit flies, in uh, worms, in uh, jellyfish, all the way to humans. And, <clears throat> and this has obviously brought to a um, hypothesis where if all animals require sleep. It is because sleep is required by the animal. So it must be doing something that is really, really important. It must be vital. So the evolutionary conservation of sleep is the first evidence for its importance. The other evidence comes from sleep deprivation studies. We know from studies that were done actually at the uh, end of the 1800s in dogs that sleep deprivation is lethal. Uh, those who are very primitive studies, they are not really being repeated, at least not in dogs. It's quite cruel. They don't do the stuff anymore past, in the past uh, 150 years. Um, 50 years ago, some of those studies were repeated in rats. And again, it was shown that sleep deprivation is lethal in rats. Rats will die after three weeks of sleep deprivation. We don't have data from humans lately. We have some anecdotal report from things like the Spanish Inquisition. But you'll agree that that's not quite the level of science we aspire to. <clears throat> it's very difficult, obviously, to draw a conclusion about whether sleep deprivation is lethal in humans. There are, uh, again, um, experiments, if you want to call them. The most famous one um, in the 90s when a student about your age uh, decided he wanted to enter into the Guinness Book of Record. So he brought a medical doctor along, and for 11 days, he made sure that his doctor was, and other doctors were looking at him, um, made sure that he wouldn't fall asleep, and record every single moment, every single activity, so that he could enter into the Guinness Book of Records. And he, and he basically uh, went through this 11 days long experiment. Uh, he ended up in the Guinness Book of Records back then, 
And now it's impossible to do because the um, it's not the kind of experiment that they really want to have in that kind of book. Um, and by the end of those 11 days, then the experiment was concluded because the uh, poor fellow was quite miserable. He was uh, very aggressive, very rageous. He started having hallucination. Um, <clears throat> so it really, he was paying a toll for lack of sleep. But at the same time, there were moments throughout the day where he was pretty okay. He could still play chess, could still play basketball, could still hold a, cons a conversation. So, was not falling apart. Um, when the experiment finished, at the end of those 11 days, went to sleep, and he didn't sleep for a week, like you would imagine. Just slept for maybe three, four hours more than he would usually do. And when he woke up, he was refreshed. So these are the kind of puzzling findings that we have to deal with. And they are really difficult to interpret, because we have to, we have to explain on one hand, why is it sleep so important that is present on all animals? But on the other hand, how comes we can go days without it, without any major consequence? Now, we don't know. Maybe prolonging the experiment would have killed the poor boy, but it's not what happened. So we do experiments with animals to solve this issue. But one thing that I think we should address first is to try and think of sleep a bit differently from what we do now, how we do now. And, and here is, again, my approach is to pr try and compare sleep to actually uh, another uh, biological need that all animals have, and that's feeding. Now, when you, we know that why, why, you, why, you, why we eat, we know why pretty much all animals have to eat, we know what happens at the single cell level when you eat, so why calories are important, why energy is important for uh, your body to function. We know a great deal about feeding. <clears throat> and we know, for instance, that uh, an adult, like us, needs about 2,000 calories a day. And that's really the bare minimum to survive. It sustains your activities. Um, it keeps you basically working. Sometimes you need a bit more. If you're training, you're exercising, you're going to the gym, you want to run a marathon, or you're studying for exams, you want to be well fed. And so that component of food that you get is the um, accessory but useful component, while the first one is the vital component. And finally, there is a third component, which is the, you know, the one we all like, but we don't really need. And um, might be an extra piece of cake, two or three, depending on people. And one thing that you experience, we all experience, is that at one point you get used to the third component very much. Um, happened to me, for instance, after I came back from the States and I was a bit overweight, as the stereotype requires. Came to England, said I should just lose a couple of kilos. So I went to a diet and I realized that the third component of feeding it was something that I was scrubbing with the same intensity as you would scrub something that you really, really need. It wasn't super straightforward to give up that piece of cake or the beer. It was something that I thought my body really needed. And actually, the more you get used to that extra component, the more you think your body needs it. And, and people who are obese really claim they have a really hard time giving up their extra calories. And it's true, they're not just making it up. So your body, at one point, fools you into believing that uh, there is something that you think you need, but you don't, because you cope very well with the other two components of feeding, the uh, necessary one and the um, useful but not necessary one. And so what if it was the same for sleep? It might well be. It might well be actually that we don't need to sleep nine hours a day, Yes, if we don't, we feel a bit crumpy and we kind of feel the consequence and we crave it. But what if it's the same as if for food? And so that's something, again, that we are not really very much um, considering in research. And, and I think it's something that we are trying to push for. <clears throat> the idea that there is a component of sleep that is, it might be vital, 
And a component of leak that may be useful, but accessory. And a final, a third component of leak that maybe might just be with boredom or us getting used to it. The other evidence for this idea is that um, amount of sleep really varies throughout evolution. So bats in a cave, they can sleep up to 21 hours a day. And horses, they are fine with three, four hours of sleep a day. Even among people, some people need their seven hours of sleep. Some other people are totally fine with five. Usually head of states, head of government, they claim they can be absolutely okay with three, two. Um, I'm not sure I believe that. <laughs> <clears throat> but it's a recurrent theme. Um, Clinton, Trump, Margaret Thatcher, um, all people, Silvio Berlusconi, all people who claim they could go on with two, three hours of sleep. Um, other people like Churchill, for instance, really was proud of his siesta in the afternoon. <clears throat> so we all need different amounts of sleep, and that might be because um, uh, there is not a single function. And, and the, the fact that there is not a single function is also, um, I would say, pushed by the observation that, as, as I mentioned before, animals like bats need 21 hours of sleep. Now, if sleep was linked to only your learning and memory performance to your being smart, then bats will have to be really, really smart animals. Um, they might be, but they don't really show it. So <clears throat> there, there might be more. There might be a component of sleep actually that is there to keep us out of trouble, for instance. So that night we stay in a room and we don't venture in the savanna, because that would be dangerous. So disentangling these components is a another aspect of research that I think is, is really, really important. And the way we do this, and I'm going to conclude here, is by using fruit flies, as I said. Now, you might argue that that's very um, surprising. Maybe you are prompted to ask me, do fruit flies really sleep? The answer is yes, otherwise I would be really wasting my time. Um, we know that they sleep, or at least that they do something that looks like sleep, because um, they are we satisfy really what we say, unanimously agree, are the five textbook definitions of sleep. Um, they have a species-specific posture, which means that during the night they lean on their legs like this. Uh, their arousal changes, which means that during the day you might be able to um, just have them fly away by approaching your hand, but uh, as they fall asleep, you need a bigger stimulus. And also, you can give them coffee and then stay awake, um, or you can sleep deprive them and they'll be really, really tired the day after. So these are all aspects of sleep that is conserved throughout evolution and we can start in, in, in fruit flies. And what we do is we try to, remove, to, to take away the, pro the problem from traditional um, brain-centric, human-centric question that sleep is by the brain, for mammals, for humans, and we translate into a animal model that is more amenable for genetic manipulation. So that one day perhaps we might be able to trigger the gene that makes the animal asleep, but only in the brain of the fly, or only the body of the fly. And then we will be able to answer questions like, is sleep only for the brain, 